this time on Hellfire Heroes. She hit him off center throttle. An SUV sideswipes a trailer truck. That is a serious impact. You think you're killing someone. If any of your baby come out feet first, the prospect of a roadside birth. How the f you deliver a baby? Has an all male crew squirming. Roadside labors can get extremely complicated. Watch out! And both the deputy chief and his youngest recruit are tested by fire. Oh, oh. In the untamed wilderness of Alberta, where seasonal wildfires can destroy a town in a single day. special breed of firefighters risk their lives no, no, no. One, two, three. to serve and protect the people who live and work here. When it's game day, just hit the engine part. It's on until the last person is safe. We got two down here. We truly are the last line of defense for anybody that's out there. From battling a raging home fire, Fanning up, whole thing. to search and rescue, No job is too big. Second crew, on me! Let's go! Or too small. There's a cat, Lucy! Because they're jacks of all trades. Hurry up, hurry up. And masters of them all. Our fire crews put their lives on the line every day. It's all about honor, courage, dedication. Serve something greater than yourself. back to one of my favorite sayings. You can never train too much for a job that can kill you. Hey, give us the pass! Chief Jamie Coots is in charge of the Lesser Slave Regional Fire Service in central Alberta. With five regional fire halls and almost 110 volunteers serving and protecting an area of over 10,000 square kilometers. Chief has to make sure his firefighters are trained to handle every possible kind of emergency they might encounter. All right, clear the stair and get ready for the victims. The people here have to be ready to go the distance. Okay, look up on them. Go. Right. Alex Pavchek, AKA DC, is Slave Lake's deputy chief and Jamie's second in command. You gotta remember how to do all this so you can teach people what to do. He was a firefighter for a long time. Kind of followed the same path as me. I was a volunteer firefighter. Then, boom, I'm a deputy chief. Can you grab a trailer? I'll grab the other one. Chief Coots, he's a great leader. He's great at showing us our way, but we all have to have our part. Fire's out. He can't do it alone. Woo! Squad 161. <laughs> yeah, boys. This weekend will be a trial by fire for DC because his boss is off to a conference and it'll be up to him to hold down the fort. When I leave town, there's been times where some really big, tough, hard to handle calls come in and they're used to me being there to take care of it. Now they got to take care of it. The first emergency call comes at the break of dawn. Responding for a structure fire on the old highway. I care you like that, dude. This will be the first time DC handles a structure fire on his own. 104, 102 is out with one and two camera. From the time that somebody calls 911 until we actually get the call, time has already passed. Fire doubles in size every 30 seconds. Hurry up, Logan! The first page came in over the radio. They said structure fire jump right out of bed, get going. Logan Skull is one of Slave Lake's most recent hires. My head is just spinning four in the morning, groggy. Only 18 years old, still have tons to learn. Address is calling. Okay, copy that. So it's just outside of Smith by the sounds of the directions there? She just said out of town. She didn't now We're not sure if it's the slave side of town or Smith side of town. They didn't really specify which town. 
The unmarked homes and nameless roads of these remote parts of Alberta are a firefighter's worst nightmare. Seriously, who is this guy? We turned onto Old Smith Highway and there's a gray car and it pulled in front of me. Afraid the firefighters wouldn't find their house, the homeowners waited by the side of the road, ready to lead the way. And then we'd come around a corner and it turned. And I'd look to my right and saw the fire coming through the roof of the structure. Yeah, guys, it's uh, just outside of Slave Lake. Time to go to work, boys. Call this Highway 88 Command. We do have a confirmed structure fire. DC is the first to arrive, and he takes charge of the scene. Whose house is this? My mom. Okay, is there yeah. anybody inside right now? No, she's no. right here. With everyone accounted for, DC can focus on the fire. Yeah, we're just around the corner from the river here, guys. One, two, one, go on the scene. Wait up by the driveway. A Swiss Army knife of fire trucks. Slave Lake's engine 161 is usually first on the scene. Carrying 1,500 liters of water and a deck gun that can knock out a fire with over 400 pounds of pressure per square inch. Yeah, the officer 151 is on scene. Tanker 151 carries 2,500 gallons of water for a truck to truck water supply. There are no fire hydrants in these rural communities, so firefighters have no choice but to bring their own water. Yeah. With the water supply lines laid out, they're ready to attack this fire. Just to give it a quick shot to knock it down. Water's coming, guys, be ready. It's started. DC uses one of his most powerful assets, the deck gun, to quickly knock down the flames. If you're ready to go, come over here. I noticed the windows weren't really black and out yet. The smoke wasn't too thick. So I'm thinking we're going to get in there and we're going to attack this fire as aggressively as we can. Lee and Logan, you guys mask up. DC sends a crew of two inside the structure to fight the fire. We're going inside. I've never been into a structure fire. But I'm with a pretty rock solid guy with Lee. I knew he's been in fires before. Start throwing her packs on right away, masking up. There's definitely a fear in the back of your head. If anybody tells you they're there at the front door and they're ready to go and they're not nervous, probably not the right guy for the job. I'm gonna get my radio on quick. DC fire attack team is uh, going in. Walking into it, it's hot in there and you can't see shit. You stick to your training, like keep your hand on the wall. We go in with the hose line and use that to protect us. The adrenaline is definitely pumping pretty hard. Just amped up, trying to get the job done. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. You got fire right above you, Lee. It's pretty warm. It was rolling above our heads. You could feel it just burning on the back of your neck. We're not advancing any. The fire is too good. We got a problem happening here. Yeah. Lieutenant Patrick McConnell keeps an eye on the volume, density, and color of the smoke. You're looking at smoke color. That can tell you a lot about what the fire's doing. And what that dark smoke tells Patrick is that the contents of the structure are burning. Logan, do you copy? Logan and Lee are still inside, and DC wants an update. Logan. Logan, do you copy? but the crew is not responding. Logan, are you okay in there? Oh, go find those guys. 
DC decides to send in reinforcements. I'm worried about the guys. I want to make sure that everybody comes home at the end of the day. We're not all just going to sit outside and not do anything about it. We're going to go in there and we're going to get done, and, and that's the way it is. Before the recovery team can even get inside, fire blows through the roof. Hey, get in there! Get up! Right here, guys! I'm pulling everybody open, okay? One continuous air horn blast signals all hands to immediately evacuate. Everybody out of the building, out of the building, exit the building. A couple minutes go by and you're thinking that something happened to those guys and you hit the horn. The fire truck's air horn signals for everyone inside the house to immediately evacuate. Finally, the two firefighters emerge. It was probably four or five minutes that we were in the structure and nobody had heard from us, so I'd imagine it was worrying DC and Patrick quite a bit. This will also not work if you're in a fire. That water gets made in that mic. It was the water that jammed Logan's radio. We didn't know if we were getting through to them or not. We couldn't hear anything back. Are you guys all right? Yeah, I'm all right. I've never been into another structure fire, but I ask Lee. My first fire, so I don't know. Well, how hot has I been in a fire? Is that how hot it is, the ones you've went into? He said that was the hottest. It forced oh, yeah. to the ground. The difference between us and movies, even if I'm really worried about somebody, the time to cry about it is not right when he comes out. You still have a job to do. Not far. So we just got into the first part. Oh, so we got off the road and straight in there. The firefighters didn't venture that far, but far enough to discover that the home isn't actually one structure, but several additions under the same roof. So this addition here, yeah. when you get in, you go this way. We just did, but then we got pulled out. With Logan and Lee out of the building, DC decides to switch tactics from an offensive strategy to a defensive strategy which means fighting the fire from the exterior of the house until it's safe for his firefighters to go back in. Plan A didn't work. You have to have a plan B, and you have to be prepared to change your tactics. What's the problem? I can't see nothing, and it's hot. They'll need to clear the smoke before they can re-enter the house. So can we put the fan at that door? OK, so why don't we do that? See, the fan's coming. Put it on the other side and see if there's a uh, the firefighters will use a tactic called positive pressure ventilation. Start the fan! A powerful fan forces air into the smoke-filled structure, increasing the pressure within. To allow the smoke to escape the structure, they'll make a second opening. Flame again right here. Downside to ventilation is your fire's gonna grow. It's lighting up in there. Fire's kind of like water. It'll take the path of least resistance, so it'll follow its flow path out of the building. It's moving left here. It's moving left here. It's getting through the window here. As the air fans the fire, the flames move dangerously close to the house's propane tanks, a new problem that calls for new measures. Bring it home, bring it home. 287 kilometers southwest of Slave Lake, near Edson in Yellowhead County, another regional fire department is called out in the middle of the night. We're going to a woman in labor. The fire chief is already on the road when he gets the call. Delta Roadside labors can get extremely complicated. Okay, go on, go ahead. So this is right in front of Highway 32, with the Bowling School. That's affirmative. Chief Albert Berry is in charge of Yellowhead County's nine fire stations. 
Over 140 volunteer firefighters serve and protect over 10,000 people in an area of about 22,000 square kilometers. The county is so large, it's a two and a half hour drive from one end to the other. When you look at distance of travel and the amount of space that we have to cover, it's a long response time on some areas. Response time is critical, especially on this call. Vehicle had hit a deer, which is not an uncommon thing. The unfortunate part of it is the vehicle's not drivable and the female that's in the vehicle is in labor. Patients is when active labor membranes are ruptured, contractions are less oh, than God. two minutes apart. For this young, all-male crew of Yellowhead County firefighters, this call is a first. How the f you deliver a baby? Uh, catch. <laughs> Out of hospital labor is dangerous. It usually happen pretty quick, so we're going to try and get out there pretty quick to make sure we can assist with everything that's going on. If Chief Barry is first on the scene, he'll take charge. And that's exactly what firefighters Brett Morrison and Zach Guads are hoping for. I'm so happy that he, he's on his way out here, too. I think part of the job of being a firefighter is being able to tackle whatever they throw at you. But you need to have the mindset to get that job done. I don't know how I feel. I can deal with death. I don't know if I can deal with life. <laughs> <laughs> this will be a great learning experience. OK, you don't need to be nervous. You got it. On a scale of 1 to 350, delivering a baby on the side of the highway is about minus 400. Uh, it's not an ideal location. We're not doctors. The second best place to deliver a baby if you can't deliver in a hospital is in an ambulance. ALS is 28 minutes to the scene. We'll beat them there. We probably will, yeah. Contractions are now less than two minutes apart. Over. That's when they go in to deliver. Yeah, this is when she drops. Patient says the baby is coming soon. Uh, they want crews to be prepared to deliver the baby on scene. We're ready for this. We're good to go. You get the call information, and it's it's very fair to say we always expect the unexpected. Just when you think you you know what you're pulling up on, you have no idea. If any of your baby come out feet first. Back up north on a property off the beaten path outside of Slave Lake. We want a handline here right now. We want a handline. A stubborn and devastating home fire has put these firefighters on the defensive. No, I need a handline right here. The fire has spread into the back of the house and now comes dangerously close to two 3,000 liter propane tanks. They've got two propane bullets sitting right beside the house. On June 27, 1993, one of the worst firefighting tragedies in North America occurred on a farm in Warwick, Quebec. Responding to a blaze at a cattle barn, firefighters discovered a 3,000 liter propane tank in close proximity to the fire. When firefighters attempted to cool the tank by hosing it down with water, it split in half and exploded, striking a fire truck and killing four firefighters. Let's go, guys, come on. As heat spills out from the back of the house, firefighters put up a wall of water to protect the propane tanks from the heat. Got a lot in there now. I can't take this all there, no. That's good, Jim. Their efforts pay off. So I think we need to man this one again. Let's see how far they get in. You ready to go? Yep. Need a break? Oh, good. Let's go. DC goes back on the offensive and sends his crews back into the structure. Hey, guys, get ready. I'm a family guy with, with three kids at home and, and my wife, and if something was to happen in my house, I'd want something to come back to. The fire threatens the family's home, and DC will do whatever he can to save anything, no matter how small it might be. There's been a lot of times where you've seen people lose everything. Anything that you can give back to a homeowner, you've done a good job. OK, so we got a bit of a plan here. You take Lieutenant Patrick McConnell relays the battle plan. Pull it down, and then I don't know as you go. I'll get you that hook. 
Adam. Logan and Lee will have to go back inside. You guys ready? Let's go. And do whatever it takes to find the fire and put it out. This has got to get pulled down, eh? All right. Logan rips down the ceiling and locates the fire in the roof. All right, it drops up. It drops in the roof. The firefighters now know the house consists of multiple additions. But that's not the biggest challenge. The structure has one roof, and the fire has made its way into the void space between the ceiling and the roof. The absence of walls or other barriers in that open space allows it to travel freely throughout the structure. We're heading it up in the room. Logan and Lee need to track the fire down and kill it with a few hundred gallons of high-pressure water. Just give that a shot. It's in the roof right there. Let's get it quick. What the? But pump operator Ryan Coots has been supplying water to the firefight for over two hours, and he's starting to run out. As a pump up, that's one of my worst nightmares is you throw everything you have at it, and then you run out of water. We're going to run into a problem, probably. You're fighting a fire in rural Alberta, right? There's no, there's no hydrants anywhere near us. If we can start shuttling water, we should be able to keep up. Ryan's got a plan. Two additional tankers from Fire Hall 3 in Smith are now on site. They'll pump their water into tanker 151 and go back to town for more and hopefully make it back before engine 161 runs dry. We want to get some sort of a tanker shuttle going. They've got to move fast, and they can't waste a precious drop. Shut your water off unless you're going to fight fire. We're low on water now. Inside the house, after tearing down most of the ceiling and exposing the attic and the roof, Logan finds nothing but smoke. We do a look around, don't see any fire behavior in there. This stubborn fire is not giving up so easily. Great in the top that bit double layer. The fire has retreated into a narrow space between two layers of roofing above the rear addition. So you think you have it out and all of a sudden it's into another section that you didn't even realize was there. A car struck a deer in the middle of the night near the small hamlet of Pierce in Yellowhead County. A man was driving his pregnant wife to the hospital. Now they're stranded, and she's in labor. And the thing about roadside labor, or any labor in general, is whether you like it or not, that baby's going to deliver. If it decides and mom decides it's coming, it's coming. Any urge to push you? In these remote parts of the country, firefighters are almost always the first to arrive on scene. Tell me when the contraction's over. Fortunately for us, she wasn't trapped in the vehicle. There was no metal bent around her. But until the ambulance got there, there was nowhere we could take her. Clearly, the contraction's done. In through your nose and out through your mouth. By you being calm, you can calm them down. And that's where you need to be. OK, quick update. We have EMS on scene. You can probably stand down all the units of the 81 over. With an ambulance arriving on scene, Albert calls off engine 12 so his firefighters can be ready for the next call. Engine 12, copy. Stand down. <laughs> for Brett and Zach, this is not the worst news. I am not upset about this yeah. at all, at all. <laughs> when that ambulance arrives on scene on a call like that, this big weight is lifted off your shoulders. It's kind of like, oh, we're passing the football off and you're going down the field, you know, and you're going to do that touchdown. We're going to move you. Firefighters help move the mother into the ambulance, and she's soon safely on her way to the hospital. Back up north, just outside of Slave Lake. Firefighters know what they're up against after two frustrating hours battling a stubborn structure fire. And it's a challenge. Yeah, and it's only this big. So it's a metal roof underneath the trailer? Trailer had its own roof, and then they put another roof over top of it all. So the fire traveled through the void spaces. It's in the roof, man. The fire burned its way towards the back of the house, traveling between two layers of roofing above the rear addition. But this home has an unusual layout, and it's difficult to navigate. 
if they're not built to code, and you're essentially messing with the firefighter's life. Here's Lee and Logan. Go with them. They know the structure already. DC sends more guys in to attack the back room. But getting into the back room is nearly impossible. All they were trying to do was get to the end of the structure, and they couldn't because there's so much debris uh, in the ditch. The initial interior attack has left piles of debris on the floor, which now makes it hard for the firefighters to advance. So they're picking it up off the floor and throwing it out the window to make room. Get it in that room, tear that roof down, and start a square problem. When they finally reach the back room, they find the door blocked. Hey, everybody over here. With no luck getting to the fire from the inside, DC pulls his crew out of the house. It's time for a new plan. If we can't get there from this end, why don't we change all that down? Yeah, I think we should. And then we at least get in that room before we're gone from that side. You gotta be able to make decisions on the fly with the information that you have. And uh, you go with the decision until it's the wrong one, and then you change it to make it the right one if, if you need to. DC and Patrick decide to cut an access hole in the exterior wall of the addition. Just as the firefighters finish cutting the hole, Thank you. the tankers return with plenty of fresh water. Alex, we've got five trucks full of water. With no more worries about running out of water, and with access to the back room, hey, Logan. DC is ready to send a crew back inside. We're still trying to fight that same okay. room. I need some experience in there. Okay. Logan and Lee already have a better sense of the layout inside. Do they break through the ceiling? You know, two by two there? Tell them hit that roof and watch the top side. And everybody's hoping this will be the last battle. He got open flame. Patrick's vantage point allows him to steer the crew towards the source of the fire. Logan and Lee, you've got fire kicking up kind of around where that fireplace was. You know where the fireplace is? Right above your head! Oh, hey, the fireplace is right here. You gotta get that open up! Logan and Lee make it to the seat of the fire, right above the fireplace. Give her a couple shots. And it looks like 18-year-old Logan Skull will have a crack at knocking out the source of his very first structure fire. Give her a couple shots. And after a relentless three-hour battle, the job is finally done. We'll let him soak after a little bit. Yeah, pretty much. Not real cool down. Oh, yeah. You just put the weight stuff on the right stuff and we're good. The fire originated from the fireplace and made its way through the house by way of a void space between the ceiling and the roof. I think they got it. You know, at the end of the day, that was still a win for us. We managed to contain the fire to that main trailer. We finally found it in behind the fireplace. Oh. How you doing, man? Uh, everybody having fun? <laughs> well, yeah, there was some pretty good uh, nozzle work in there. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> When you know the fire's out, when you're fairly confident it's out, you feel pretty good, because you know you've done your job. We mark this fire under control at this time. Roger, fire under control. For the men and women of the Lesser Slave Lake Regional Fire Service, it was a long, hard-fought battle. But DC's aggressive strategy paid off. 
the structure is still standing. Uh, so for the homeowner, you know, uh, that's that's a big deal. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh. Doing this for as long as I've done, there's been a lot of times where you've seen people lose everything. It takes its toll on you after a while, so anything that you can give back to a homeowner, you've done a good job. The family got a few of their memories out of it, right? Um, so that's a win. This is the brother we lost. I learned a lot from this fire, you know, how fast things can change. It took a team. It wasn't one guy that went in there and did that by himself. And, and that's why we do what we do. We're all the type of people that like to help, and we all like to do it as a team. At the end of the day, those guys were the ones that were still in there pulling the roof down at the end. Always remember that one, for sure. It's my first structure fire going into, so that'll be with me the rest of my life. Two hundred and eighty-seven kilometers away, just outside the remote town of Edson, Alberta, Lieutenant Dave Mickey is responding to a nine-one-one call for a smoldering tree. 1209 Mickey from 1229 Wood. Checking on your location. I'm just on the river bed right now. I can smell smoke, but I don't see anything yet. These firefighters know a smoldering tree is a wildfire waiting to happen. So whereabouts is this? Oh! In peak season, when you have dry conditions, an ember can cause a major fire and very quickly. Add any amount of breeze or wind to that, and it's uncontrollable. The general public's conditioned to know that when smoke's coming off of something, it's not normal. And we always say, if in doubt, dial 911. Go for dispatch, over. Yeah, uh, dispatch, just an update. We have a tree that's been hit by lightning that's smoldering. We're just going to put some water on it and try to dose it as best we can. Comes back. It's a wage day. Proper definition. Worn like a backpack, rugged and easily transportable, the fire extinguisher backpacks hold almost 20 liters of water and are used by firefighters to put out small patches of fire in hard to access areas. When did we get lightning? I didn't see a storm. Lightning strikes in the summertime in this area are all the time and you get these small fires. Lightning ignited wildfires are on the rise driven by an increase in volatile thunderstorm activity. That's not good news for the world's largest habitat, the boreal forest, which takes up 57% of Alberta. And that's why these firefighters are quick to respond. So what I want you to do is go up there and hit that up top first, okay. best that you can. Okay. Stay off to the side too, in case it's going to fall. I am so happy that the Yellowhead County came and found our little fire, our big fire in the tree. We're lucky it wasn't more. It made sat here and burnt for how long? I'd probably from Monday. Oh, for sure, yeah. My concern on this one, and I personally, is that it's gone in. Oh, because it's an older tree? Yeah. You'll have a tree that gets hit, and the lightning could go down and actually ignite the roots. And that fire just kind of sits there and chews a little bit, and then bam, the wind picks up, and we've got a major fire going. Go down to the river, fill up again. While the tree is no longer smoldering, it's what they don't see that concerns them. Just come around here and just around the base of here. Okay. Just spray around. Spray around. A holdover fire is one that lays dormant for a while and then flares up. Slow burning embers from a lightning strike can smolder for months, burn down into the tree's roots, 
travel underground and last as long as an entire winter until hot and dry or windy conditions turn the dormant embers into a full-blown blaze. Just give it a little soak here. I'm just trying to get some water on the ground and saturate a little. So if there's any uh, sparks or smoldering underneath any of the roughage, you know, we'll extinguish that. We soaked it pretty good. Dispatches this command 170 over. At this time, I'm going to call this uh, fire is out. Fire is out, over. You guys are awesome. And you're such a good looking bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Near the foothills of the Rockies, the wide expanses of wild forests, countless hectares of farmland, and the prolific oil and gas fields of central Alberta are an enormous challenge for first responders to protect. Come on, Logan, I'm ready to fly here. But new techniques are now being implemented to safeguard the area's residents. We're just going through our drone training program right now, so just getting the rest of the crew kind of up to speed. Not all fire departments have these yet. It's definitely a new thing. We're just getting the program started. OK, so that is like your um, throttle. Logan Skull might be Slave's youngest rookie, but he belongs to a new generation of firefighters. And he's teaching the older dogs some new tricks. Logan is kind of like the almost rookie. He, he's been here since he was 14 years old at the Future Firefighter Program. On the surface, he's quiet, soft-spoken. Turn with the drone. Whenever you turn it, you turn too. Okay. But I can give him a project. We got some new drones. Hey, I need a drone program. You're gonna do the drone program. No problem. Step up and do what needs to get done. Drones are particularly useful for fighting structure fires, search and rescue, and providing aerial photography for post-fire investigations. Okay, so put the landing gear down and then try and land it. We try and stay ahead of the ball. Being from a smaller town, we don't get all the stuff sometimes that the big cities get right away. So then right when you're about to touch the ground, just lift the camera up. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Take it for a spin. Man, it's like harder than you think. Water or are you sweating like that? Like a dog. At Fire Hall One, oh, just Chief Jamie Coots returns from a two-day conference. Okay, we're doing a quick debrief. While I was gone, you guys had a trailer fire, so I think uh, DC, you were on. When I got on scene, there was uh, smoke coming from the kind of the middle back of the trailer. Right. Yeah, those trailers are the tough ones, right? You, you guys did a great job. You got the fire out. That's good for the people. That's good for us. There's a lot of things there that speak to all the training that you do over and over and over again. That's huge. You guys did a great job. It was teamwork. But Chief Coots has high praise for DC. <laughs> I think he's doing great. He can keep the thing on the rails when I'm gone, and uh, he's understanding the concept. And I think we're the fire service is lucky to have a guy like that. I really enjoy um, doing what I do, and I have a great leader that I can learn from. So I want to learn from him as long as I can. You want to train everybody to take your job someday. No, I want everybody from the bottom level all the way to the top level to be training the person underneath of them to be able to take their job someday. Never know when I'm going to get hit by a bus, and now it's your day. Now you're running the place. Thanks, everyone. Let's get out of here. Woo! <laughs> but as much as Chief Coots knows he can delegate, he's pretty much a hands-on type of guy. And when an emergency call for a two-vehicle collision comes in, Chief Coots is quick to respond. Semi versus SUV. And everything's fine except debris on the highway. Find that hard to believe. Years of experience have taught Jamie to expect the worst when responding to a truck versus SUV collision on Highway 88. Up in central Alberta, long stretches of two-lane highways are the only lifelines between Slave Lake and the rest of the country. 
Lots of five axle rigs and multiple trailer trucks sharing the roads with passenger vehicles keep the fire hall very busy. Motor vehicle accidents are about a third of our call volume, so we're definitely used to going out to car accidents. 61131, just be advised there's a lot of traffic on this highway and a lot of log trucks. Arrive alive, not fast. 161, copy that. The thing about Highway 88 is it's got narrow shoulders, so people ride the center line a little more. We do see a fair number of sideswipe collisions. It can range from very minor to pretty serious stuff. Not a man. You can see where two rims are caved right in. Like, that is a serious, serious impact. You don't uh, cave in rims on a truck without some real serious force. Holy Whoa, good side You drive past that first semi and you see all the damage on the side of the semi and you're thinking, holy shit, what does the SUV look like, right? Grand Prix is bad. Definitely gonna need the RCMP, please. That car looks like. A collision between two trailer trucks and an SUV on a lonely stretch of Highway 88 has Patrick fearing the worst. You usually see that kind of damage with semi on semi, but uh a little SUV did that, so you start thinking, holy cow, where's the people at? So who was driving? Huh? You're OK? You're wearing your seatbelt. Yeah. Wow. Driving at highway speeds, the SUV drifted into the oncoming lane, sideswiped a multiple trailer truck, which caused it to spin 180 degrees directly into the path of a second semi-truck, which had been following the SUV. The collision threw the SUV off the road and into the field. You think you're killing someone, and that's the worst part of it, is the thought of your actions killing them. I'm still shaking. Both those truckers were really working hard to make sure they didn't hit her. Without them doing that, it could have been way different. Right after it happened, I ran up, and she got out of the passenger side of the car, and she's walking around somehow, which is awesome. Thank goodness she's alive. You see how she is shaking like that? That's the adrenaline still, right? You can probably feel that you're a little jittery and jacked up there still, so. She's jacked on adrenaline. The number one thing you can do to get someone to come down from shock is to just talk to them. What's your name? I'm Jamie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. Actually, way nicer to meet you like this than what I thought we were coming to, so. Yeah, super scared, hey? Hey, Patrick? Yeah? She's saying she's OK, but I just want to get a better look at some of this stuff and get an ice pack on her. OK. And uh, yeah, just quick head to toe. Here comes an ambulance anyways. I'd start asking you a whole bunch of questions, but these folks are going to probably come and ask the exact same one, so I think I'll just wait for them so you don't have to do it twice. So basically, she hit him off scent throttle. So right on that driver's side front corner here, and you can see, feel it right back to the engine. You can see all the curtain airbags went off. You know, if you look in here, there's all kinds of equipment, right? Everything in that car is moving down the highway at 110 kilometers an hour. All of a sudden, you stop and everything that's loose in that car continues to travel at 110 kilometers an hour. And that projectile could hit you and or anyone in your vehicle and hurt you. So, I mean, she's super lucky. That's crazy, yeah? If you look over the last couple of years, we've seen more and more people walking away from vehicles like this. Compared to 10 years ago, this probably would have been a fatal collision. So I think uh, there's something to be said for new engineering and vehicle design. It, it's true, these things are so safe. And sometimes, you're just lucky.